The New Deal refers to this economic recovery project the United States embarks on with the election of Frank Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. Um, and essentially during this time frame, um, through, through different parameters between 1932 and 1940, um, the New Deal refers to this expansion of the United States government um, and the transformation of the definition of citizenship based on that expansion. So during this lecture, we'll talk about uh, the New Deal uh, programs in two distinct phases. Uh, first phase uh, initiated in 1932, building off of some of the reforms implemented by Herbert Hoover. Um, and in the second phase, you know, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt expanding upon those projects to include um, and to construct a broad uh, welfare apparatus. And then we'll transition to some of the limits of change uh, based on the political economy and racism in America um, during that time, as well as the way in which this New Deal pro project transforms the concept of America uh, during this time. So when we last left off in the last lecture, the United States was uh, undergoing a severe economic depression initiated as early as 1929, but we could really see the ramifications um, and the signals of that, that economic depression earlier on before. Um, and immediately Herbert Hoover um, takes action. Um, however, his response is much different than the response we see with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So uh, because of Herbert Hoover's political stances, um, he, he sees the role of the federal government as very, very small. He's quite conservative. Later on in the semester, as we get to the rise of conservatism um, in America uh, during the 1970s and early 1960s, um, we'll see uh, Herbert Hoover as a major icon of the conservative movement of that later era. But right now, he is true to his, his conservative roots um, and centering his political position on small government. So um, the, the response that Herbert Hoover enacts um, is similar to Franklin Delano Roosevelt with one huge exception. Herbert Hoover um, does not want the federal government to take a central role in rebuilding the economy. Rather, he's leaving it to, number one, states to repair their own economies. Um, second of all, he's really encouraging philanthropy um, to uh, ameliorate some of the negative impacts of the economic downturn. Um, and we can see this in the Glass-Steagall Act, um, as well as the, the Home Loan Bank Act. Um, which were two pieces of legislation initiated under Herbert Hoover, but um, uh, later ratified and, and, and passed um, under FDR. So FDR gets a lot of credit for those P2 pieces of legislation, um, but they're really initiated under Herbert Hoover. Aside from these two pieces of legislation, Herbert Hoover is also um, increasing spending on public works projects, but only at a state level. So, for example, um, turnpikes and, and highways uh, throughout the metropolitan area, New York metropolitan area, These are, many of these were initiated under Herbert Hoover as a way to incentivize the local economies to rebuild from economic devastation. When we get to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we're going to see many of these same ready-to-work projects, but extrapolated onto a federal level. So now you have the federal government stepping in and controlling many of these projects that were formerly controlled by states under Herbert Hoover. So in the election of 1932, um, it's really a very, uh, the election of 1932 is really a landslide uh, in many ways. Um, and it's no secret because, and it kind of makes sense because the last time uh, Herbert Hoover is, last time the last time we see Herbert Hoover um, is during the, uh, a bonus army protests in 1932 on the eve of the election when he essentially uh, commands the US, U.S. military to forcibly evict veterans who are protesting on the National Mall um, in which, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of veterans uh, were injured. So uh, going into the election of 1932, uh, Herbert Hoover has e extremely negative press. Not only is he uh, blamed for a lot of the economic devastation, but also he's seen as, as a kind of uh, villain in the, in the eyes of many Americans because he's attacking veterans who many of them who have given their lives um, and their limbs uh, in defense of this country. And by comparison, FDR really seems like a miraculous candidate. So he's, he's a very wealthy candidate with um, deep roots in the American Republic. And his distant cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, who also had served as president as well as other offices on the federal level um, and state levels of government as well.
Um, and building off of the success and the renown of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, who um, in his last unsex unsuccessful election called for a square deal, FDR now uh, in this political campaign in 1932 calls for a new deal, a reevaluation of that square deal of the progressive era. So in a way, he is invoking a lot of the progressive era initiatives, even though Herbert Hoover himself um, was a part of that initiative um, and a part of that, that movement in the early 1920s, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is also invoking that, that kind of vocabulary and that kind of uh, political rhetoric, but um, with a much different emphasis on, on, the, on the role of the federal government. So in all intents and purposes, um, uh, Herbert Hoover wins by a landslide, as you can, as you can uh, see in this diagram here. Um, and what's important about uh, FDR's uh, election in 1932 um, is his constituency. So the New Deal constituency, the New Deal coalition, in other words, um, is comprised uh, primarily of out-of-work people, um, both black and white out-of-work people. Um, and this carries on um, into the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, up until the 1960s, when the New, New Deal coalition is ultimately with the rise of conservatism, when uh, conservative ideologues and politicians are appealing to this, uh, consti these constituencies of, of working class people um, and separating them um, based on um, wedge issues, like, for example, school busing um, and integration of schools. But for, between the 1932 and 1964, uh, the New Deal coalition uh, remains this vibrant um, and powerful um, voting constituency in the United States. So Roosevelt's response. To be sure, Roosevelt did not enter office with a blueprint for dealing with the Depression. Herbert Hoover didn't either. Uh, but in fact, uh, FDR did uh, build on the blueprints that Hoover uh, implemented, as we talked about, extrapolating the, fed the state initiatives to a federal level. At first, FDR relied heavily on the vice of groups of intellectuals and social workers who took up key positions in his administration. So this is important as well. So FDR stocks his cabinet with key advisors um, and activists um, throughout the American American society. From legal, for example, Secretary of Labor uh, Francis Perkins was a veteran of the whole house in Chicago, um, as well as the, the and he was among the few key witnesses uh, to see the Triangle Shirtwaist fire in 1911. So there you have Francis Perkins, as Secretary of Labor, um, with, a with a deep and rich background in labor activism. Other, other members of, of FDR's cabinet, um, all, FDR also pulled other members of his cabinet from um, the administration of Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, so many of his members of the cabinet um, had served under Teddy Roosevelt um, in enacting many of the progressive uh, pieces of legislation that, that have transformed American society. Louis Brandeis is another key figure here, who during the Woodrow Wilson's administration served as an advisor, but now as a Supreme Court justice, um, also influenced Roosevelt's policies as well. So the presence of these individuals reflected how Roosevelt drew on the reform traditions of the progressive era and extended them into this new era of economic change. But it's also important to keep in mind that um, Roosevelt is elected um, with a cohort of very, it's also important to keep in mind that Roosevelt wins election during uh, a period of, of global political transformation. So, for example, um, Roosevelt takes office in 1933. It's the same year that uh, Adolf Hitler um, is elected to uh, German chancellor in Germany uh, and triggering a fascist wave that spreads throughout Europe. And just before that, in the late 1920s, uh, Benito Mussolini similarly wins election. So here you have uh, two fascist ideologues elected at the same time that uh, FDR is elected. And by all intents and purposes, FDR is uh, pushing a very socialistic platform. So in these three examples, you have candidates whose platforms are considered radical for their time. Okay, um, and they're all initiating economic stimulus programs to revive their economies, but in different ways. 
Uh, FDR is pushing a more socialistic platform, whereas Mussolini and Adolf Hitler are pushing a more fascist platform. Nonetheless, all of their programs, all three of these people's programs, uh, result in an arms buildup and increased aggression that eventually lead to World War II. So all intents and purposes, the economic devastation that um, FDR and, and Hitler and Benito Mussolini are responding to um, lead directly to uh, another world war in 1941. It's important to keep in mind that uh, the problem here with the Great Depression was not merely economic, it was also environmental. So the Dust Bowl corresponds to this extreme drought that ensues and takes hold in middle of America in the Southwest. The Dust Bowl refers to this extreme drought that devastated much of the Southwest. In an already arid environment, this extreme drought devastated agricultural economies in this area. And so here you have an instance where um, uh, environmental devastation is directly impacting uh, economic devastation, compounding the economic devastation of the Great Depression. So once he gets in office, FDR not only has to contend with the uh, impacts of economic downturn, but also the ecological uh, devastation that's taking place on the Southwest. Both are intertwined in their applications um, and the devastation that people experience. One of the first things that FDR, one of the first things that FDR does um, when he gets in office is he shuts down all the banks. He, he declares immediately a banking holiday so that banks can reorganize their finances um, and restructure their lending practices. So the National Bank Holiday 1932 temporarily shuts down banks to reorganize the leadership and cut costs to those banks to make them fiscally solvent. Building on that tide, he declares an emergency banking bill. And with the emergency banking bill, um, it, it permits the sound banks, those, those banks that are healthy enough to continue doing business, to reopen with government support and oversight. And that's the key here, government support and oversight. So banks ideally would mitigate their uh, risky lending practices. The Emergency Banking Bill 1933 also establishes the FDIC, and that is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, and this is essentially a government system that insures the accounts of individual depositors. Now, there are other banking reforms that FDR enacts um, in this first wave of the New Deal legislation. But I, at this point, I want to transition to another aspect of the New Deal program. And this pertains primarily to public works projects, like those we saw under FDR. And there's two in particular that I would like to touch on. First is the Civilian Conservation Corps, or colloquially known as the CCC. Um, and then secondly, the Tennessee Valley Authority, or the TVA. Both in their own way, uh, transform American democracy through the direct intervention of the federal government. The Tennessee Valley Authority, essentially modernizes an area of the United States that was still living in, uh, in the 19th century. So this Tennessee Valley area uh, is, is marked by the confluence of rivers throughout this area. Um, and so to give a sense of the living conditions of this area, uh, very few people had running water. In fact, the most common form of running water was the river in the back of your house. Okay, So you get a sense that there was no plumbing, no electricity, no telephones, uh, certainly no large-scale banking, um, no manufacturing industries. These people are still living in the first half of the, of the 19th century. And so the Tennessee Valley Authority essentially pumps in money into this area to develop industry and improve the lives of the people living in this area. Give the, this area the tools with which it will help uh, regenerate the economy in the surrounding areas. So the TVA essentially develops this, these rural poor communities in the Tennessee Valley, Tennessee Valley area um, by providing new jobs. So federal funds are immediately pumped into uh, dams that are implemented throughout this uh, Tennessee Valley River area. So the dams particularly are uh, electro -hydro hydroelectric dams that are going to provide electricity for the surrounding areas. So these are federally owned uh, and operated hydroelectric dams, um, but they are employing 
local people in this area. So not only are they are going to provide electricity for the communities of, the area, of these areas, but they're also going to provide jobs for these people, long-lasting jobs. Ultimately, the TVA projects um, electrify 45% of rural America who at this time had not experienced or not had, had not benefited from electricity. That means street lights. That means house lights. That means home products. That means cars. But that also means improved education, um, improved health care, and improved sanitation for the people living there as well. Now the Civilian Conservation Corps. So the Civilian Conservation Corps um, is really building off the uh, land conservation initiatives of Teddy Roosevelt. But when FDR comes into play, he uses those uh, initiatives towards, uh, he pushes those initiatives towards economic purposes. So the Civilian Conservation Corps is essentially uh, a federally mandated program that hires young unemployed men, specifically, and white men to be sure. And these young men are engaging with environmental conservation work, say, say for example, building and improving national park facilities, uh, constructing roads and trails, uh, erecting telephone poles in these areas, um, probably building off of the TVA uh, initiatives, as well as uh, digging irrigation ditches and planting trees. If anyone has ever been to Bear Mountain State Park, um, the Conservation Corps um, is res was responsible for constructing many of the trails uh, throughout that state park. By the end of the program in 1942, more than 3 million people had passed through CCC programs. That's exponential. So where they... Each person received government wages at $30 per month, which is a high living wage at that time. Um, and the CCC made a major contribution to the enhancement of the American environment, not to mention the economic uh, impacts that it had as well. So we see two aspects of the New Deal programs crystallized in the CCC and the TVA. On the one hand, uh, enhancing environmental conservation. On the other hand, um, using public work, works projects not only to employ people but to rebuild the economy and build the infrastructure that a, a modern economy is meant to run on. Moving into the second phase of the New Deal program, we see a much different kind of tactic in play. The Works Projects the Works Progress Administration um, essentially allocated $4 billion during its time uh, between 1935 and 1938 um, to state and local governments uh, for tens and thousands of cultural products, which were meant to uh, enhance. So this program essentially employs 2.1 million people who worked various different jobs. So some of the manual labor jobs included uh, building roads, schools, public facilities, where some of the white collar upper class jobs uh, included writers, historians, uh, actors, and artists, all paid by the federal government to uh, complete works that would are meant to enhance the lives of Americans broadly. Um, other work included state-sponsored murals, artist murals, um, as well as state-sponsored entertainment. Other projects included military projects, like the construction of two aircraft carriers that were implemented, um, that were critical in World War II. Uh, those are the Yorktown and the Enterprise aircraft carriers. The broad majority of uh, those employed under the Works Project Administration were men. However, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt also uh, prodded FDR to include nearly 400,000 uh, women under the WPA, as it's known, um, working as nurses, te teachers, and seamstress seamstresses, as well as various artists. What transpires over the course of the New Deal programs that are implemented uh, from 1932 to 1941 um, is a kind of American welfare state that emerges of a government social safety net for individuals. Um, and this corresponds to this definition of citizenship that's expanding uh, broadly at this time with the expansion of the government. So here you have FDR uh, really enhancing economic opportunities as a pillar of American citizenship. And we can see this specifically in the Social Security Act of 1935. So the Social Security Act of 1935 um, provides un things like unemployment compensation, old age and disability insurance, as well as child welfare. And so this term welfare um, becomes coined on, during this, this era um, as 
as an aspect of the government that is now providing protection, economic protection, um, and financial protection for its citizens. The Social Security Act of 1935 uh, was very important because it embodied Roosevelt's conviction that the national government had a responsibility, a responsibility to ensure the material well-being of ordinary Americans, and that means citizens. Um, it created a system of unemployment insurance, of old age pensions, um, and aid to the disabled, okay, to that and up until this point, um, had been left to themselves, you know, to defend for themselves. But with the implementation of the Social Security Act, um, the government is now taking responsibility for providing for the material welfare of its citizens, which is a landmark, um, a landmark piece of legislation that really expands the role of the government, and in a way, harks back to the promises of Reconstruction, the failed promises of the Reconstruction era in which the government attempted to provide the material uh, welfare for newly freed African Americans through the 40 acres and a mule policy. Those early initiatives were, were uh, ultimately undermined, however. Um, but in a way, we can see um, some of the promise of the Reconstruction era uh, fulfilled during the New Deal, the New Deal era. But as we'll get to, there are several limitations to the New Deal era that are predicated on the political economy and the racism that's prevalent in America during this time. So none of the ideas and, and government programs in the New Deal uh, were original ideas. Many of these were progressive initiatives uh, and, and straight out of the progressive platform 1912. Um, which had also called for old age pensions um, and assistance to poor families with, and with dependent children. What was new, however, was that in the name of economic security, the American government would now supervise not only temporary relief, but permanent systems of social insurance. And this promise, this new responsibility of the federal government became the bedrock of the American welfare state. The New Deal era is also known as the Red Decade, primarily because of the socialistic policies that FDR was putting in place, but also because of the explosion of socialistic um, and communist parties within America. And in the 1930s, communism was a, a quite popular political ideology in America. As this Communist, communist Party card uh, illustrates, uh, it's quite American uh, to be communist, that, that communism actually fulfills a lot of the promises of Lincoln's version of Reconstruction, ameliorating the social injustice and, and the racial inequality uh, of American democracy um, in the 19th century. And so many Americans, particularly African Americans and those, uh, uh, and those Americans who had for, uh, and those Americans who had been disenfranchised from democracy turned to communism as a vital political force during this time. And so during this era of uh, New Deal socialistic policies, um, communism and socialism in America explodes. Only two days, only two decades later, however, um, Anti-communism anti ultimately persecutes many of, of these politi political. Only two de only two decades later, however, uh, a, a, an intense wave of anti-communism after World War II ultimately persecutes many of these political activists and members of communist party. And as we'll see, that anti-communism also has a racial discriminatory tone. Now I'd like to turn to some of the limitations of the New Deal uh, initiatives, um, and there are two in particular, um, and there are two categories of limitations, namely the segregation, like for example the CCC as we talked about, um, and discrimination, and that comes in the form of a specific prog program called the Home Loan Corporation, um, this process of redlining and determining uh, federal benefits. Roosevelt conceived of his new neo platform as an expansion of the meaning of freedom by extending assistance to broad groups of needy Americans, those unemployed, elderly, and dependent, as a right of citizenship. So economic independence as a right of citizenship, or economic support as a right of citizenship, not charity or special privilege. But political realities in America during that time, um, especially the power inherited in ideas about gender, um, black disenfranchisement in the South, 
powerfully affected the drafting of much of this legislation. New Deal programs were justified as ways of bringing economic security to, quote-unquote, the people, rather than to specific disadvantaged groups. So in all, different Americans experienced the benefits or the lack of benefits um, of the New Deal programs in various different ways. For example, benefits flowed to industrial workers, but not to farmers, to men and not to women. Benefits certainly flowed to white Americans more than blacks who in the South were still deprived of basic rights of citizenship, as we talked about during, re during the end of Reconstruction. By far, however, the most discriminatory policies um, of the New Deal platform had to do with housing. So the Home Owners Loan Corporation, founded in 1933 as part of this robust package of New Deal policies, essentially refinanced many home mortgages and debts um, and, uh, and accounted for the refinancing of one million uh, American homes. So the Home Owners Loan Corporation uh, created the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration. Um, and this is a program that still runs today um, that provides federally backed loans for home mortgages. Um, and what this does ultimately uh, into the late 1940s and 1950s is it encourages uh, suburbanization by providing uh, mortgages at very affordable rates. The economic depression in 1929 devastated the American housing industry, and so the, corrupt, the construction of new residents all but ceased in the 1930s. And in banks and savings loans associations. So what the FHA did um, is that it insured millions of long-term mortgages um, and issued private, private, private loans. So what the FHA did um, is that it issued millions of long-term mortgages um, issued by private banks and backed those private banks, uh, particularly through the FDIC. Um, at the same time, federal government itself built thousands of units of low-rent housing and public housing. So the New Deal housing policy represented a remarkable departure from the previous government practices. Thanks to the FHA um, and later the Veterans Veterans Assist Veterans Administration, home ownership came within the reach of tens of millions of families, and it became cheaper for most Americans to buy single-family homes in the suburbs than to rent apartments in major metropolitan cities during this time. But the limitations of this policy really have to do with racist discrimin discrimination within the legislation itself. In short, this policy, the, in short, the FHA was racist in its determination of allocating federal benefits. Federal surveyors allocated uh, federal benefits um, using insurance maps like those featured in the right corner of this slide. And surveyors would allocate federal benefits based on an assessment of a neighborhood. So those neighborhoods marked by red were considered risky investments um, and there, therefore were subject to higher interest rates, whereas those um, marked by blue were considered favorable neighborhoods and therefore subject to lower interest rates. Um, it turns out, though, however, that those marked in red and therefore risky were also um, non-white or black or Latino. It turns out, however, that those marked or outlined in red were also more, more than often African-American communities. And so those uh, assessments, those federal assessments for benefits um, were quite discriminatory based on whether or not it was an African-American community. And so what happens is that um, mostly white Americans are benefiting from this housing uh, policies. What happens is that uh, the Federal Housing Administration um, enforces. What happens is that um, the Federal Housing Administration, through through favorable interest rates, encourages um, the expansion of suburban communities by providing um, favorable interest rates for white families to move out to the suburbs. Black families, however, because they're excluded from these benefits, remain in cities. So that, that by the 1950s, um, as uh, suburbs are booming, uh, cities begin to decline economically because of the erosion of the tax base. And many African Americans are trapped in a position where they see the cities declining around them because of this, tra this economic transformation. Um, and they see the urban services and 
utilities decline exponentially into the 1960s and 1970s. And so that African Americans um, that had moved up into the cities um, as early as the 1920s with the Great Migration are now trapped in these cities um, and entrapped in the cycles of poverty that are, that are predicated on the discriminatory lending practices of the New Deal. So as a consequence, the federal housing policy powerfully reinforced segregation, not only in the South, but in the North as well, and, existing ra and intensified existing racial boundaries in the North as well as in the South. The Federal Housing Administration had no hesitation about insuring mortgages that contained clauses barring future sales of, to non-white buyers, um, and it refused to channel monies into integrated neighborhoods. Right off the bat, it's extremely discriminatory based on the federal employment practices also discriminated on the basis of race. Housing was not the only aspect of the New Deal policies that were extremely discriminatory. Federal employment practices were also discriminating on basis of race and gender. As late as 1940s, as late as 1940, uh, of the 150,000 blacks holding federal jobs, only 2% occupy positions other than menial only 2% occupy positions other than menial roles of clerks or custodians. And we can see this similarly term in terms of discrimination against gender, in which women are not women do not advance into higher managerial positions. And so over this period of time between 1932 and 1940, um, we see the expansion of the American welfare state, um, the expansion of this, this, this idea of citizenship to include economic um, protections. Overall, however, uh, it's kind of ironic that all this work goes into building up the American welfare state and expanding citizenship when, in fact, none of the policies of New Deal worked in recovering the American economy. It isn't until um, the American economy is yet again engaged in a world war that we see that we see the economy rebuild to levels at which it was once operating before the economic devastation in 1920. So some of the key terms to keep in mind here are this idea of the welfare state. Um, the Glass-Steagall Act is not something that we, I don't think we've covered it in this lecture, but we covered it in the last lecture. That's a very important critical aspect. We'll cover it again in discussion sections. The Public and Works Administration is also a central, a central component of the New Deal program. Um, what is the Dust Bell Bowl? You're, um, we're going to talk about who Jacob Lawrence is, um, the Social Security Act, and the way in which it expands this idea of citizenship. Um, what is redlining? Uh, and finally, what is the Tennessee Valley Authority?